Hello, my name is Chris Daud and I'm doing biomechanics research at the University of Liverpool. Mick and Peter have already given a nice and broad overview of the topic, which means that rather conveniently, I can skip some of the background about barefoot walking and talk more a bit about my own research. I'm a biologist by trade. I've been studying locomotion, which is how animals move about, including humans, for a long time, and obviously all animals are barefoot. When I started to study humans, I therefore found it very logical to study people who had never ever worn shoes. Not only because barefoot is best, or not necessarily because barefoot is best, but because to me as a biologist, it's the logical starting point. After all, we have been barefoot throughout our evolution. From early amphibians, which you can see here uh, on the left, the blue one, more than 300 million years old, um, to early apes, which you can see on the bottom right, to ourselves, modern, anatomically modern humans who have been around for about 200 million years. It's only very recently in our evolution that we started to wear shoes. Um, it's in the last seconds, so to speak, of our evolution. Um, so uh, we all wear shoes, not because it's necessarily the best, uh, but it's what we do. Um, now, I'm, as a biologist, I'm interested in biologically normal human gait, and therefore, I think we have to study barefoot walking. So it is, it is our starting point. Now, it's not easy because most of us wear shoes all the time. So should we go through all the trouble to try and find people who are habitual barefoot walkers, who only walk barefoot? Or can we just keep on studying short people in the lab the way we've always done before? I decided to go and find out, and I had to go to India for it. Here you see on the left hand side, you can see what I call my Indian mobile lab. I tried to replicate a lab in India and we did measurements on people's foot sizes and measurements uh, of width and length, for example, and we measured how the pressures under their feet evolved as they walked, as you can see on the right hand side. And we've got quite interesting results, which told us that uh, true habitual barefoot walkers have a better or a more distributed pressure pattern under their feet, as you can see in the middle on the left, compared to the middle uh, habitually shot picture, which is a similar person, same village, same background, etc., except that they have been wearing shoes most of their time. You can see subtle differences in the pressure distribution. If you go to Western people, that's the foot on the right, you can see that the pressure distribution is even more poorly distributed. <laughs> now, we also found so they have better distributed pressures. We also found that they have wider feet. They don't just have wider feet, and here are just a few examples on the top of habitual barefoot walkers, on the left and in the middle. Um, they have wider feet, they also have relatively larger feet. Uh, their feet are a bit more flexible, and I rarely saw flat feet in my Indian. In over 200 uh, people from India I studied, I saw virtually no flat feet, which is quite different from what you would find uh, with us. So if this is all true, we might ask the question, if barefoot looks sensible, why do we need shoes at all? Do we, do we need shoes? Uh, well, we have to keep two things in mind. First of all, the naturalistic fallacy, which means it's not necessarily because something is natural that it has to be good, or it has to be the best. Secondly, shoes are useful, and here are some, some examples of why I believe shoes can be very useful. If you look in sports, shoes become equipment and they can help you run faster or injury free. If you are a patient, for example, with diabetes, shoes become therapies. These are examples of shoes that are very useful um, to humankind. But for daily walking, for normal life, do we need shoes? I would still argue, yes, they are still useful because they protect us against sharks, for example, and against the cold. And let's admit, shoes are desirable as well. But how about all these features that we tend to build into modern, what we call modern shoes, cushioning, arch support, a constricting toe box, a raised heel, etc. Do we need those? Maybe not. Actually, all these features have no evidence supporting that they are doing something good for us. So my idea is, why don't we start from scratch? Why don't we start from a shoe that tries to be as, as less of a shoe as it can be, and then only add the features if we can demonstrate that they are beneficial. And that brings us to 
minimal footwear to minimal shoes. What's a minimal shoe? It's a shoe that basically tries not to be a shoe. It is flexible. It has an anatomical shape, so it respects the shape of the foot. It has no heel. It has a very thin sole. And it has no motion control or stability devices. You might think, all oh, that sounds quite fancy. Um, and indeed, you can buy fancy minimal shoes. But we did not invent minimal shoes. If we look around the world in different uh, indigenous populations, people have for centuries been wearing shoes that we think are minimal. And here you see a few examples from on the top from South India. Then we have some reindeer boots, which look very sturdy, but they're actually very flexible from uh, the Sami in northern Scandinavia. And then we have a sandal from a southern uh, African people in Namibia in this case, and then we have a commercial minimal shoe. Uh, so we started studying uh, walking in minimal shoes, commercial ones and indigenous ones, again, uh, initially in India, and this is work um, with Catherine Willems from, from Ghent University. Again, we tried to replicate a lab. We put equipment on our volunteers, and what did we see when people walked with their indigenous shoes and barefoot? We saw that minimal footwear, even though it is minimal, it is still footwear. It changes slightly our impact peaks if we walk. It also changes slightly how our foot strikes the ground and how we unroll from the heel to the toes. So um, we have been doing this for quite a few years now, and we, we've concluded, yes, yes, footwear changes our anatomy, as we've shown, and it changes subtly the way we walk in terms of pressures, in terms of movements, and in terms of impact. And that's true very much so for conventional shoes, but also to make to some extent for minimal shoes. So um, is that a problem at all? Maybe walking with minimal shoes or with shoes in general is different, but better than walking barefoot. Um, in order to answer that question, I'm going to focus not on everything we could talk about, but on two aspects that are very relevant uh, if we talk about footwear, which is uh, balance, do the shoes help us to keep stable, and strength, can shoes help us to gain stronger feet? Uh, I will talk about strength first. Now, why should we care about strength in general and foot strength more in particular? Well, as we age, we all lose strength. And that's a line that we can show schematically on this plot. So on the horizontal axis, you have age, so we become older, vertical axis is strength. When we're young, we all are strong and we are above what we call the disability line. Now, as we get older and we lose strength, we might cross this line. And if you fall below the disability line in terms of strength, you might not be strong enough to fulfill your daily tasks. So the challenge is to stay above this line. Now, what happens if you are stronger, even at a younger age? Um, you will remain stronger throughout life. You will have more leeway or you, you have built up a buffer, if you will. And this is really the range that we find in the, in, in the population. So some people have been strong throughout life and therefore, even though they lose some strength, they remain strong enough later in life uh, to not cross the dis disability line. This sort of work, trying to stay happy and healthy and on your feet for as long as possible in your life, that dominates the work that me and my colleagues are doing in our institute at the University of Liverpool. So how do we measure foot strength then? Uh, it's not so easy to do, but luckily, um, oh, and I should add foot, foot strength and foot weakness, the opposite, is related to falls. So people have shown before me that if you have a relative weak foot, you are more likely to fall. So that makes foot strength very, very relevant. So we're going to measure foot strength, and luckily I had a PhD student called uh, Rory Curtis, who is also a mechanical engineer, and he designed an apparatus, which you can see on the left, which allowed us to measure foot strength or toe strength. And as you can see on the plot in the middle of the slide, um, if you ask people to wear minimal shoes for half a year, and you measure how much strength they have after this period of half a year, you can see that in a control group, basically people who have been asked to not change anything, there's no difference. In the intervention group, which is people who have been wearing minimal shoes for six months, not for athletics, not for running, just daily shoes, they gain about 60% of foot strength just by wearing the minimal shoes. If you keep doing that for much longer, which is the right-hand side bar, which is called experienced, 
your foot strength doesn't increase very much at all. So we think six months is enough to gain foot strength. So we've been shown, showing, and some people have done that before us as well, that minimal shoes make your feet stronger, or the way I like to put it, it's not really true. What is true is that conventional shoes might actually be making our feet artificially weaker. So that's why it's strength. Minimal shoes can help us build strength. How about balance? And why should we care about balance? Well, balance is related to falls. And each year, 30-60% of older adults fall. And that's a serious issue. 10-20% to of these falls results in injury, hospitalization of death or, or death. So how to study falls? It's tricky because you can't study falls themselves. People, even the fallers, they fall very infrequently. So the, the odds of them falling in your lab are actually very, very small and you, you don't really want that to happen. So what we need to do is estimate the risk of falls by using other uh, metrics. And that's exactly what we've done in two ways. We first measured stability in static standing, which we call postural stability. And then we've looked at stability during walking, which we call gait stability. So um, let's look at postural stability first. How do we measure that? Here you see a video of uh, the same person standing uh, in a more stable posture on the left and a more unstable posture on the right. On the left, the person is standing barefoot and you can see that the white dot between the two feet, that's the center of pressure. If it moves a lot, you are quite unstable. If it moves very little, you are very stable. So you can see on the right hand side, the dot moves much more than on the left. That is because this person was now wearing unstable shoes, shoes with a very soft rockered sole that were actually designed to make you less stable and as a result, give you more strength. Now my question is, can we gain strength, but at the same time also remain stable? Can we have our cake and eat it too? To answer that question, we first look at what I just said, the postural stability standing still, and I will show you the results now, which we did on a range of footwear. So we studied, as you can see in the top, um, a few types of conventional footwear that people would often wear, and then a range of prototypes of minimal footwear, all minimal, but slightly different. And the bottom line of the research we did, looking at the white dot at the postural sway, is that minimal shoes, any minimal shoe we tested, is more stable than the conventional shoes we tested for posture. Okay, that's standing still. That's all nice and well, but we don't stand still most of the time. We walk a lot. So how to measure stability in walking? Well, that's really tricky because if we walk, we are intrinsically unstable. We are not statically stable as we are if we stand still. People say that walking is controlled falling. Every step is basically controlled fall and you avoid to actually fall by putting your foot in the right place. And where you put your foot tells you how stable you will be or how unlikely or likely you are to fall. Now, the good thing is it's possible to calculate where we should put our feet in order to be most stable during falling. And that's an approach which we call the extrapolated center of mass, which we have calculated for people with a history of falls. So they are a very relevant population to study the risk of falls. And which are the results? So on these slightly complex plots, you see where this extrapolated center of mass is related to the foot. So you see three plots. Every plot has a little foot. And if you look at the four quadrants, the pale quadrant on the bottom right is where the extrapolated of mass, center of mass should be to be more stable. And as you can see in the middle plot, which is the minimal footwear, the extrapolated center of mass is more often than in any other uh, case in the more stable zone. And it's very few times in the darker gray zones. And we actually did some statistics on this and we've been able to demonstrate that even during walking, as in standing, minimal footwear is most stable. It's more stable than conventional shoes. It's even more stable than barefoot. So this brings us to our conclusions. Uh, barefoot, it is natural, but it is not necessarily the best or not necessarily the best for everyone. Shoes should be minimal to start off and only add features if we can show them to work or to be beneficial for us. Minimal shoes help the foot regain the strength it's supposed to have. 
and minimal shoes can help you for stability. Thank you very much. And I would like Vivo Barefoot in the invitation to present some of our work here. And I would like to um, thank the funders who have supported our work as well.